Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is part three of our three-part series on a, a, a basic uh, IGP compliance, um, General Industrial Stormwater Permit, or IGP for short. Um, this one's going to be on sampling. And uh, we're going to go through and talk about the different uh, recommendations on sampling. And, and uh, in the previous in the, in the previous one, we talked a little bit about the requirements of sampling, and we'll probably touch on a lot of that as we go along. Uh, because uh, this is talking about the how-to of sampling. The other one was the what are you expected to do. This one is, well, let's talk about some things you can do. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, let's get started. Oops. Uh, there we go. All right. So the goal of this workshop is to give sampling guidance. Uh, there is a attachment H of the general permit has very detailed sampling guidance. In fact, it references an EPA guide from 2009. It also actually uh, talks about an older one from 1992. Um, but a lot of the things we follow in the permit now, a lot of them uh, are dependent on uh, the guide from 2009. So, for the sake of time, given this one hour format, we're going to give you some quick general tips and recommendations for performing compliant IGP sampling. Okay? So, first off, representative sampling. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. Well, what do I mean by that? That means you don't want to grab samples in such a way that are careless, that are seemingly careless, that are, a lot of people make mistakes where they grab samples and say, oh man, we have these really bad numbers. And then when I talk to them, I find out the numbers were bad because of sampling protocol. Uh, for example, I had a client years ago, I got them out of the general permit because their SIC code didn't require them to be, have permit coverage. But when they were under the permit, um, they had a series of ponds. And in the third pond, they would, the water would build up and then eventually discharge. And when it discharged, you'd grab a sample. So one of the guys, I told him, um, you'd always grab a sample and the numbers always, because of the three ponds, they had a lot of settling of solids and everything and their numbers were always great. Well, all of a sudden he grabbed samples and they came back high for total spinning solids and they came high for pH. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? So then I went over what happened, the sampling protocol. And first of all, they had added some sort of new area to the pond. And so they had they'd put in some fresh, um, pylons which had cement and he grabbed samples and so what happened was he decided he's going to grab some samples so he put on some muck boots and walked into the pond stirred up a bunch of stuff grabbed samples and then uh he and instead of grabbing samples where the water left the, where it left the pond right there at, at the discharge point he grabbed samples over by where they had just installed some new concrete pylons so his ph was high because just that little local area if you grab samples where the water left it was fine and two, he had high solids because he just walked in and stirred up a bunch of stuff and grabbed samples. So when you grab samples, you wanna, you're gonna find out, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of iterate, reiterate, you need to think through what you're doing, okay? You need to think through how you do it. Uh, that way you can get a truly representative sample. And we will talk about representative sampling because you wanna collect a sample that's not cleaner than average, but also not dirtier. Um, some people try to trick the system and grab samples and for example say they have a conveyance system where everything connects to a sample point and leaves a property but they grab samples from a drain close to it where it's just getting some runoff from the from the uh, from the surface but not the total representative sample well that's not a representative sample at the same time um i've had clients where they grab samples from a set of drain kind of find out their drainage system is connected to a whole bunch of other drainage systems so they're grabbing samples of everybody else's stuff besides their own both of them don't represent what's happening on your site. What are your BMPs doing? What are your practices doing? Are they, how's your water look? And that's what the water board wants to know as much as you do. Because many times you'll find that your, your stormwater can be affected by others. And so you want to minimize that as much as possible. So section 2.2 of the EPA guide, and that's what I'm calling that one from 2009, describes a representative sample as discharges prior to stormwater leaving your facility and at a location downstream from all your industrial materials and activity. 
The reason behind requiring such a location is so that it's the sample is representative of a facility's discharge, taking into account the types of pollutants that may be contained in runoff from the property. So what I like to do is I came to stormwater years ago in 2006. I knew very little about stormwater and um, John, my supervisor, really him and several other coworkers really trained me on, on the, the general permit and about stormwater and all types of things. And so I, like, I come from a perspective when I first started that of knowing nothing. I mean, I knew nothing about stormwater regulations. I knew I got the, I got the general permit and I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, what is this? So I like to take things like the official uh, information and try to put it into words that pretty much anybody in my position when I first started would understand. So in other words, the way I would describe representative sampling is a representative sample should reflect the quality and quantity of stormwater discharges leaving your property, okay? So I don't know if you remember, but I think in part two, we talked about discharges. Discharges is water fluid leaving your property. If it doesn't leave, it's not a discharge. And if you remember from our previous sessions, those who had joined us before, um, this is a surface water permit that you're under. So as a surface water permit, unless you have water going to a surface water in the United States, streams, lakes, riverbeds, some, or, or an MS4 program, in other words, a storage drainage system that goes to one of those, it's not a discharge. It has to leave your property or go into a drain where it leaves your property, okay? So uh, if you want, but you want to have a sample that represents what you do. So um, let's take a look at, uh, that's a representative sample. It's something that, for example, so if you have all your drainage goes to one point, that point where the water leaves, your point of discharge, or sometimes people call it outfalls, basically, you know, we used to call them outfalls years ago. That point where water leaves, that is representative because it's, it's collecting all the water from the facility. We have a client in uh, Stockton where their facility is, is on a street where everybody along that street connects to a storm line line that goes through their property and onto other properties. So if they were to grab samples from inside of the drain, they're grabbing samples from 10, 12, or more other businesses. So they have to actually grab, they had to end up having to collect the samples from each one of their outfalls, or excuse me, each one of their, their storm drains, and treat them as outfalls because they couldn't get a representative sample, one that's just their stuff. So uh, what they did was they, uh, uh, they ended up making each outfall or each drain and all fault or a point of discharge in and of itself. Um, because that way that represents the water leaving their property. So smart sampling starts with planning ahead. Um, first of all, uh, you'll find with this permit, many times they'll say, uh, make a plan, uh, uh, do a procedure, you know, uh, you're supposed to basically think ahead. The whole point is preparing for sampling. It's not something that just happens. It's something you have to prepare for. <clears throat> so first of all, you need to have an understanding of the general permit and what it requires. And in particular, uh, sections 10, which is the, the stormwater pollution prevention plan and monitoring plan uh, section of the, of the plan, and then section 11 of the permit, which is the monitoring section. So in our first session today, we talked about section 10, which is the, the, the subsection. Our, section, our second part, we talked about section 11, which was a monitor section. And now this is gonna encapsulate the two with how to do sampling. It's kind of a addendum or kind of an added to part two of the monitoring plan. So first of all, you need to have a, a, at least a good general understanding of the, you don't have to know the whole permit. I mean, there's like 20, 20 some odd sections in the permit. So, you don't have to understand the whole permit. That's pretty, pretty much someone's, my job or job of someone who, who does this for a living. But you do need to understand at least sections 10 and 11, at least enough. And your stormwater pollution prevention plan should reflect um, what you need to know. If it doesn't, then you need to revise it to do so. Um, you also make sure that you have a good monitoring plan. Your monitoring plan should have descriptions of your sampling, of what you're sampling for and where your sampling locations are. Um, I've had some SWEPs where they kind of mix the monitoring plan and the SWEP and, and you try to go through the whole thing trying to figure out where things are. I understand that, but I, I would recommend having a, an area that is strictly your monitoring plan section. So that way you can see, okay, here's what we're sampling for, here's where we're sampling, um, and know exactly what you're sampling for. 
make sure that you have a laboratory set up, an ELAP. ELAP is a certification that they use uh, for approved laboratories, and, and the Water Board prefer, uh, requires you to use an ELAP certified lab. They actually have a list on the Water Board website with ELAP approved uh, laboratories. Um, have your sampling bottles and equipment ready before the wet season starts. Again, you need to be prepared for it. Don't, you know, rain comes and all of a sudden you're scrambling for your bottles and scrambling for your materials. You want to be ready ahead of time. You want to get, you start getting ready now. Right now it's nice and dry and we have a nice warm days. Now would be the best time to get started on, on getting things going. Um, I would also recommend having your, uh, some, some laboratories allow you to use uh, your own chain of custody. Uh, which I prefer because I can customize it. I can put on there the type of bottles I need to have. I put on there the type of constituents I have. I, I get that all pre-printed out. So all I have to do when the rain comes is just fill in the date and time on the chain of custody and sign off on it and who, who did the sampling. Um, ideally, that's the best way to go. Now, I would always do. Then what I'd recommend is using their chain of custody uh, and preset their chain of custody. If, if they give you a blank one and they insist on doing that, then if I were you, I would take the time to fill it out ahead of time, mark everything off with the exception, of course, of the date and time of the sampler, but have everything else marked off ready to go. So when you do have to grab a sample, all you have to do is sign it and date it. Make it, make it easy on yourself. As previously stated, smart sampling starts with planning ahead. So, Give yourselves every chance of a positive sampling result by installing BMPs before the rain starts. Try to find ways to reduce stormwater discharges. This is, um, in many ways, a really big deal, if possible. Uh, some people, they don't have that choice. They're landlocked or they're in, uh, I know some clients where they're integrated with other facilities and trying to separate their stormwater runoff from other stormwater people's runoff is a challenge at best. So, um, what you want to do is, if you can, if there's some way you can create ponds, even if they don't meet the treatment, I mean, we talked about, I think it was section one, we talked about treatment controls and how um, there's a certain standard for those. Even if you don't meet the treatment controls, you can still put ponds in, they just can't call them treatment controls, but they are an advanced BMP, they're a stormwater containment. So if you can do that, I recommend that you do. Um, if you could put in berms or vegetative swells, things to help mitigate the pollutants in your water, Anything can help. So, but again, all this needs to be put into place before it rains. So, reducing stormwater charges is one of the advanced BMPs listed in the IGP, okay? And it's called the Stormwater Containment and Discharge Reduction BMPs. It states in section 10H2B and then Roman numeral two that the following. These, this, uh, these include BMPs that divert, infiltrate, reuse, contain, retain, or reduce the volume of stormwater runoff. Dischargers are encouraged to utilize BMPs that infiltrate or reuse stormwater where feasible. So they're saying, okay, fine, you can't build a pond that can reach the, 80, that can reach the 85th percentile 24 hour storm criteria or, or that, you know, that criteria as outlined in section 10H6 of the permit, okay? That, that, that has to be certified by, a, by a, 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 uh, an engineer. But you still can build a pond. You just can't call it a treatment BMP, but it's still an advanced BMP. It's still a good idea uh, uh, for several reasons. One, maybe you can build a pond that can have the capacity that would qualify for a treatment control, but maybe you don't have the funds or the feasibility to actually have a professional engineer do the calculation on it. Fine, still build it. You won't be able to call it a treatment BMP, but you'll probably almost never have a discharge. And the whole thing is discharges where there are third parties that the Clean Water Act allows people sue them on behalf of the environment. Um, and the, the third parties have a lot of their abilities based on uh, your discharges. So if you collect your discharges and you have a few discharges and the discharges you have are clean because you have a lot of BMPs in place, you really lower your liability in that area. You can never say there's never a zero liability, but you can reduce it by quite a bit. One is put in something to reduce it. Put in a vegetative swell, put, uh, put in um, some ponds, put in some bioretention cells. Try different things. Um, who knows, maybe uh, some permeable pavers or permeable ground. 
try different things so that way the water, you, you encourage the water to soak into the ground, encourage the water to stay on site rather than discharge. Oh, and if you do have a pond, then they're good because they're a good BMP. They have to settle things out. You could put some BMPs around the exit point. You can control discharge better. You can get a clean place to grab a sample. There's just a, a lot of advantages if you can do that. And the, and the water board says in the, in the permit, they encourage you to do that. So that's a, that's a positive. Remember, from part two of the IGP, basic workshop series, you only need to sample if there's a discharge. If there's no discharge, you have to sample. Remember, surface water permit, no discharge, no sampling. So if you have sheet flow, you should consider something to direct or capture runoff such as berms to direct the flow or using a utility box as a sump to collect flow. Um, for example, sheet flow is where water flows over a wide area and runs off. Many times people say, well, I can't grab a sample because the water just runs off this whole area. Well, in times past, people would say, well, I, really don't have, I, I, have, I don't have a real good way to grab samples. So sometimes they would try to use a dustpan to grab a sample or something like that. But if you look at the, the requirements, especially at the, at the EPA guidance, the 2009 document, which I referenced earlier, grabbing samples of oil and grease need to be done directly into the bottle. So they're like, well, I really can't do that. That's not an appropriate way to grab samples now. So again, that's why I said earlier, planning, uh, you have to plan ahead for samples. So what do you do? Well, why don't you consider using some berms? In fact, I recommend this to a client and, and I have a picture of it where they put some berms in and redirected the flow to uh, a utility box, much like you see here, this, this example here. Um, and there, there, there's some advantages. Again, you don't, the utility box, there's a couple of advantages to them. First of all, they have a permeable bottle. So when the water goes into them, they'll eventually soak under the ground, okay? Two, you're not grabbing samples from the water collected in those boxes. All you're doing is using those boxes to help you maneuver your bottle to get underneath the flow. And so for this one client, they were having sheet flow off their facility and it was getting commingled with a bunch of other sheet flow from other facilities. So what they did was they used some berms and they redirected the berms until they reached a point where there was a, uh, a slab of cement and in that way the berms were able to channel that water from the runoff along the berm to that slab and into a utility box. And I have a picture of that. Um, so a good thing about using the utility box, again, you don't have to do this. This is just, a, again, these are recommendations. These are suggestions. Everybody's site is different. Everybody's site has unique challenges. So these are recommendations or, 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 or uh, things to consider, okay? So for them, doing that worked. They had a berm, they put up a berm, and as you can see, the, uh, the berm w captured their sheet flow and then went along here and into a, a, a box, and they were able to capture and, and have room to maneuver in their bottle or anything, grab a sample. So, uh, and also the good thing about, a good thing about these boxes is uh, you can cover them when you're done. So if you put a box in it uh, with pedestrian traffic, you can get a box that can handle pedestrian weight. If you're in an area where you actually have to collect samples where there's actual vehicle, well, you can get these boxes that can handle vehicle weights. Though again, grabbing samples in vehicle traffic areas is a little, uh, if it's avoidable, if it's avoidable, you can. If not, then just make sure you put cones up or make sure your safety comes first. But um, either way, you pull the cover off, grab your sample, put the cover on, it's no longer a trip hazard. Um, and it's covered up and then the water that got into that box while you were grabbing your sample will now just soak into the ground. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of using those. And this has been very successful to them. They, the water flows into there and they grab a sample and it's been, it's very good. Other clients have done something like that, something similar. We have something here we call the legal flush. <laughs> what do we mean by that? Remember the general permit allows for up to four hours during business hours or up to 12 hours prior to business hours for sample collection. So I need to go back and kind of retrace the steps from um, section or part two. When you grab samples under the IGP, general permit IGP, um, you have two, you can grab two samples. First of all, during business hours, say for example, your business is Monday through Friday, seven to four. If rain starts, not discharge, but if rain starts and then an hour or so or even less time flow begins, 
and you're able to grab a sample, that's the time the clock starts. And so you have four hours from the time that discharge starts to grab that sample during business hours. Now, if rain starts outside of business hours, um, like the night before or whatever, and you come in the next day and you have flow, or within four hours of start of business, you have flow. As long as your as long as your start of business is within twelve hours of the discharge, you can grab a sample. So it, we went over this in detail a couple of times in, in part two. You might want to if you haven't seen that, you might want to review review that. But the bottom line is, if you grab samples, um, by the way, I recommend um, if you have a chance to grab a sample the next day under the twelve hour rules, I call it. Those are the samples to collect. You're not trying to cheat the system. You're not trying to get around it. This is something they allow you to do. Um, two, um, everybody's stuff, like I said, there's, there's agriculture, there's other businesses, there's cars that are not properly tuned up. There's all types of things that land on your property. So let that flush through and then grab your sample because in the water that you're grabbing, the sample you're collecting is a sample that presents what's leaving your property after it's gone to your BNPs. So as a general rule, do not attempt to collect your samples in the first five minutes of a qualifying discharge. Remember, not cleaner than usual, but also not dirtier. Remember we talked about representative sampling? It has to represent the quality and quantity of water in your property. It needs to represent what you're doing. If you have, a, I have a client, and I mentioned previously, where they had stuff coming out of the air and land on their property, and we proved that air deposition was causing their problems. So you never, you never assume that you're, you know, that the first five minutes, I, I would assume the first five minutes of flow as a rule is going to be your worst quality because it's not you, not just you. It's everybody else and you. Um, so for, in most cases, I'd recommend waiting before you grab a sample. Um, moving on. So in terms of your, your bottle, don't overfill your bottle. Um, bottles come with preservative. Um, so, uh, preserves are usually acids. So, uh, when you grab, when you grab a bottle, you want to make sure that you, uh, don't flush out your preservatives. Now, oil and, uh, total suspended solids, that's a plastic bottle. Total suspended solids doesn't have any preservative in it. So if you fill up your bottle and it fills up to the top, that's okay. You're not going to be a problem. Uh, go ahead and fill it up, close it up. Um, and that's fine. And if, if water flushes out of it while you're grabbing a sample, that's okay. There's no preservative. But samples like oil and grease or VOCs that use that use little volatile organic uh, analysis files, the VOAs, or if you grab metals that have nitric acid in it, um, a couple of notes too. Uh, nitric acid is a stronger acid even than, than the usually HCl, sometimes the sulfuric acid solution that people use for oil and grease or HCl. Um, you want to make sure that if uh, that you're wearing gloves when you're grabbing samples, you want to protect yourself uh, because you just don't know. Um, a story: uh, years ago, I was collecting a sample for a client at the store, Port of Stockton. While we were grabbing samples, uh, I used to grab samples, and we used to have to look for conductivity, and the conductivity was usually pretty, pretty low, not too bad. Um, it was uh, usually 40 to 60 micromoles, no, no big, nothing big. Um, and then one time, I grabbed a sample. And their sampling point was they had a fence and then they had a low spot where the water would come and the water would come and there'd be a nice spot there where I could reach a bottle in and get the flow. It worked out really nice. But uh, I came back and the samples were, the connectivity was through the roof. And we were trying to figure out where that connectivity spike came from. Well, unfortunately it came from the, this area. Truck drivers used to park in front of this facility waiting to get into a facility down the street because the facility down the street was filling up trucks with fuel and it was a relatively small facility. So the trucks would back up and have to park or just line up in the street waiting for the turn to go in and get their trucks fueled, you know, their tanks filled with fuel to go off to the two gas stations. So unfortunately truck drivers, because they are paid by the load, they want to keep going. And so unfortunately they had uh, fluids. They, they would not get rid of until they just dumped it out of their door right there. And so I know for sure that when I was grabbing samples that day, I ended up grabbing, grabbing samples of bodily fluids. Um, and so I was wearing gloves and I was real glad I was. Also, another time I was, I was working on some BNPs with a coworker 
and we found some nasty stuff around the corner here that would flow into that drain. And we know that that drain was receiving uh, flow from some things that were really rather disgusting. So you never assume that the stormwater is clean. I always assume that there's a problem with it, even if there isn't. And you want to protect yourself. Okay. And two, you will also want to protect the quality of your sample. Um, some of these methods are very, very sensitive. Um, for example, copper, 0 0.0332 parts per million or milligrams per liter. That's very, very sensitive test. And if you're, and if you're grabbing a sample and you're careless in how you grab that sample, it could cause a problem. You can end up having numbers that don't represent who you are. Like I said before, the one guy walked into the pond, mucked everything up, grabbed the sample, got high solids, high pH, and really he shouldn't have. So when I talked to them, that earlier story, he, uh, they got a sampling pole and started grabbing samples near where the water left the, the pond and their numbers went back to normal. So uh, some smart sampling tips. One, um, uh, here how you approach it. Two, consider uh, before you start, can you capture water? Can we do something? Can we build ponds? Can we build bioretention cells? Can we build vegetative swells or gardens or, or areas? And then three, if you, do, if you do have sheet flow, perhaps consider setting something up where you put up some temporary berms or something where you, or, or berms that you can redirect the water so that way you can get a, a, a decent flow. The water board, if, if the water board is not going to, um, uh, they don't approve of you using secondary containers, especially for point number two here. Oil and grease samples must be collected directly into the laboratory bottles. No immediate, uh, intermediate devices are allowed. So if you look at section 3.2 of the EPA guide, it talks about sampling for oil and grease. Um, because they believe that if you grab a sample in one bottle and then pour it into your oil and grease bottle, that some of the oil and grease will stick to the inside of the, of the secondary container and you're gonna get a false positive result. So they want you to collect the water for oil and grease directly into the bottle. And usually, so far, as far as every time I've grabbed samples, it's always been an amber bottle with either sulfuric acid solution or hydrochloric acid in it. So uh, make sure when you grab your sample um, and you grab your bottles, make sure that you, um, um, that you have the proper bottle with the proper things, with the proper amount. And again, don't overfill it, don't, because if you do, you're gonna flush out your preservative and it could disqualify your sample. Sometimes a lab can add preservative back into it, but you can't guarantee it's going to happen. So uh, what I recommend on the bottle, I probably should have brought a bottle with me, but on the bottle, the, where it turns into the cap, um, if you could uh, fill it between the shoulder of the bottle and the base of the cap. That way you have enough water because sometimes I've had clients grab samples where they don't grab it where they need to. And then they come back and, and then say, we can't, the, their lab said, we can't, get a, we can't get a reading on this because there's not enough water, not enough fluid. So a uh, couple of things you want to consider. One, also when you go in the field, you want to bring some extra bottles with you. Why? Because I've dropped oil and grease bottles before and they've broken. And then you're like, oh, great. So now I have to collect, you know, so you, you lose your ability to grab a sample and then you miss an oil grease or you miss something because you dropped and broke it. So I recommend always bringing extra bottles with you. Uh, so just in case you do drop or break something, you can grab another one out and have it available. Um, I always fill it up all the way to the shoulder of the bottle or at the base of the cap where you screw it on. That way you, um, you're guaranteed to have enough water for your sample. Um, and then many times what, what we did was we purchased these little bubble wrap containers or bubble wrap things that you could put your bottles in. Most of the time the lab will provide those for you, but you might consider getting some of the bubble wrap so that when you put your bottle in there, you can wrap it up in it so it, it'll have some protection against being broken. Um, then you wanna, when you grab samples, many times people use a swing sampler. A swing sampler is a pole with a, a device on it where you can attach your bottle to it so you can reach down and grab a sample from inside a drain or inside a conveyance, okay? Um, that, um, those are very handy. But some mistakes that people do is they scrape or gouge the bottom or they scrape or gouge on the sides trying to collect samples. That's not a good idea because what you're doing is you're artificially creating solids that wouldn't normally be there. So what do, what do we recommend? Well, I recommend um, that you take your time now, here's something that um, I'm a CWISP, which is a qualified industrial stormwater practitioner. 
the water board came out with a, um, a film for training quisps, people like me, on recommendations for sampling technique. And one of the things I recommend is when you go inside, you go inside a, a, a sample, consider putting a weir, a, a block inside the drain in parts, so that way you can build up some water. That way you'll have a nice pillow of water to be able to grab samples. There are, there are um, preventative maintenance things you have to do to make sure that it's clean. You don't want to grab it right away, let it flush through a little bit. So there are some things you want to do, but there's something you consider. Like I said, if you have sheet flow, if you use the berms and use the, the uh, utility box, that's a good way to be able to capture samples. Um, you don't want to dirty the water, as I talked about before, when they walked into the pond, they stirred up a bunch of mud, they stirred up a bunch of stuff that caused a problem. You don't want to do that. They, they used a, a sampling pole and they came back uh, much better. Um, you want to avoid contaminating your samples. You want to use clean equipment. So I'd recommend storing your equipment in a place where it's not going to have a problem. Um, lunch rooms uh, or rooms where you have running vehicles or running things, not the best place for it. Um, I have a, co a former coworker where we used to do, um, we still do a lot of our uh, groundwater sampling. And they, they use these balers to go into the, to grab samples. Well, this was back in the time when a lot of uh, gas stations had uh, underground tanks that were leaking into the water table and causing some serious issues. And so that's why they brought out a law a few years ago where gas stations had to swap out their tanks for tanks that wouldn't leak into the water table. And so one of our jobs was to go in and to use balers and to grab samples of, of uh, these uh, samples of those drains. And so my coworker in the back of his truck, he had a container of deionized water, okay? Or excuse me, either or distilled water, but it was clean water. And he used some balers and used some things and, and he went to a place where when he grabbed samples that had a layer of product sitting on top of the water table. So we had, we had this monitoring well and he grabbed samples from the monitoring well and all his equipment smelled of, of uh, hydrocarbons very strongly. And so he put all that stuff in the back of his car, in the back of his truck, and he had a clean bottle of distilled water, uh, I believe it was distilled water, uh, separate from where all the equipment was. However, it was in the same back section of his truck. Well, for field sampling, especially when it does groundwater sampling, sometimes they do something called field blanks. So I'm sure many of you are, are, uh, uh, know what this is. But a field blank is where you, you collect your sample, but then on the field, you also fill up another bottle with using dionized or distilled water as a control sample. So you can show whether or not the surrounding area is contributing to pollutants to that. And so you send your, your compliance sample along with your field blanks, as they're called, with it. And so we got back to resolves and the field blanks had hydrocarbons in it, but the water he grabbed from the next well didn't. And, there, and so we were like, how in the world did we get hydrocarbons in our field blanks, but not in our actual samples that we collected from the well? Well, it turns out that all the hydrocarbons and things from the previous well that he grabbed samples that had that giant layer of products sitting on top of the water table, we were doing remediation on that, um, was it actually penetrated through the plastic bottle and caused a problem and contaminated the container. As a result, um, we had uh, some major issues with that, with that problem, with, with that uh, thing. And so if we learn from that, learn from that thing that it penetrated through the plastic bottle into its clean water and caused a problem. So from that, we know from now on, whenever we have any clean water or we have any water we use for fill blanks, we always would keep it in the cab of the truck and any kind of materials that we use that have uh, contaminants from hydrocarbons, we would keep in the back of the truck. So that way we wouldn't commingle it and, and cause cross contamination. So you want to use nitrile gloves. Um, and change them at each location. So we talked about that again, but I want to kind of reiterate that it's really important because my biggest concern isn't, uh, well, it is concern that you contaminate your sample. So I do want you to have a positive, accurate result, okay? Because if you have any exceedances because of, of sampling protocol, then you're, you're having to have a quiz do a follow-up, and it's, it's, it's just a major trauma. Um, however, um, I'm more concerned about your health. And I talked about earlier about those samples locations where they had some, I know there were bodily fluids and, and different things making it to the drain. That's 
not healthy, not safe. So you really do want to protect yourself as much as you can um, against contamination, but uh, mostly for your health. You just don't know what's in the water. Um, I've worked in several clients that are in areas with a, a high uh, homeless population around there. And there's a lot of things around there that make it into drains. So you want to protect yourself. Um, you don't want to do any smoking or eating or, or drinking while sampling. You want to avoid anything, especially when you open containers. Um, when you have your containers, you, when you get your containers from the lab, make sure that you don't open them up until you actually open them up when you're grabbing a sample. So when you get, when you get your sample bottles, hang on to them and, and, and make sure they're okay, good to go. Make sure the lids are tight, but do not open them until you're actually on the field, open them, grab a sample. Um, as we talked about in part two, when you grab your sample for pH, you're supposed to do your pH within 15 minutes of collecting your sample, okay? So you can use pH paper, again, thinking ahead. I know we talked about this in part two, but I would like to reiterate. You wanna make sure that your pH paper is, first of all, still good. I've had clients where they grabbed samples of pH and it was bad, and then they found out later it was just because the pH strips they had were no good. So make sure your pH strips are good. What you do is you, I'd buy a fresh pack every year. I would test it, and, and I'd test it in, um, in, in your uh, tap water, but tap water is usually around an eight in terms of pH. So test it in tap water. If you have buffers, even better, test it in buffers. Uh, my preference is to use a pH meter. I think a pH meter would be better uh, because they're more accurate. You calibrate them the day of use. We recommend creating a pH meter log. So if there's ever a question as to whether or not your, your pH readings were accurate, you can show that you calibrated your, your log. The, you're supposed to calibrate or you're supposed to use your pH meter uh, to manufacture specifications. And most manufacturers require calibration the day of use. So in other words, once you calibrate it, it's, as a rule, it's good for that day. Now, each meter is different, so you want to look at what your meter says. But as a rule, most pH meters, when you calibrate it, it's good for the day. So you might consider doing, doing that. Uh, I, I much prefer a, a meter because I think it's a lot more accurate. Um, and then, uh, and so then that's what you want to do for that. And then two, um, you want to make sure that, again, you have your containers closed. And then when you, when you collect your sample, you don't want to, you want to collect your sample. If you, if you collect a sample, especially like in your areas where you can pull your vehicle next to it, turn your vehicle off, put on the emergency brakes or whatever, or lights there, protect yourself, put cones up. Um, you, you want to make sure that you're not around. If you can collect, uh, for example, again, we talked earlier about thinking ahead. When you grab your samples, are you going to grab your samples in a place where there's going to be other contributing factors that don't belong to your industrial activity? So maybe you do need to consider redirecting your stormwater and grabbing a sample somewhere further upstream from where you are now. Uh, because if you have a lot of influences from outside, who knows what people, you know, some people do. So consider looking at grabbing samples that really truly represent your facility. That's why I talked earlier about the berms, about using uh, the utility box or, or any, any similar situation. Um, you, uh, the, the, in the guidance document for 2009, the EPA guidance document, talks about storing your samples. You need to store them on ice at four degrees Celsius, which is 20, 29 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and transport those to the lab. That helps to preserve them best. Um, again, you want to use plastic and bubble wrap if you can, something to protect your bottles. Again, don't breathe, sneeze, cough, do anything that can cause or compromise uh, your bottle. So we really, um, again, um, this is the first time I broke down my training into three parts. So what I'd like to do is I actually have um, a, that part of that video that I talked about, the quiz training. I'm gonna like to see if I can cut to some of that, um, perhaps if we have time. But first of all, I'd like to know, are there any questions on the chat? Danny, do we have any questions from people on the chat? At the moment, there is no questions. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, I wasn't planning on using the video this time around because uh, I wasn't sure about how much time constraints we have, but since we have, we have, a, we have plenty of time, I'd like to cut to that video and get to a certain point where I'm gonna show you some of the examples of how to properly sample. Again, this video was created for CWISPs, but I think there's enough good general information that uh, I think it'll be helpful to you. So let me, let me uh, discontinue uh, showing you this screen and let me go to, uh, real quick to the video and I'll be right back. Okay, 
am I? Okay, so let me go. What I would do, click the uh, red button. Yeah. There we go. And go ahead and go to Google. I have it saved, thank goodness. It was here. I have it saved. Well, I thought I had it saved, but I guess I don't. I'm, I'm almost positive I had it saved. That's okay. Well, we can go. I was hoping. I was hoping to have that because that's a great. It would really help you us. You have it in your history, maybe. Possibly. So, um, sorry for the delay, but I, I really wanted to show you. I really wanted to show you that. Try going to three dots here. This one here, uh, right here at the top. So, because I want to scroll down and see if there's a YouTube one from a couple of days ago. See if you can find it. Yeah, yeah that'd be that'd be great. I want I would like to show you that. Okay. Perfect. So go ahead, and then just you just need to reshare your screen. All right, so how do I do that? So go to Zoom, go to share, look for the YouTube tab. Right there? Right there. Yep. And you gotta make sure audio down here. All right, share. All right, here we go. Here's, uh, here's that video I wanna share with you guys. One of the most here. common and challenging types of stormwater discharge at sample is sheet flow. Sheet flow is when stormwater doesn't collect in a ditch or channel, but runs off across the surface of a facility. And then is your audio on in here too? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. So while we're waiting, again, uh, is there anybody on the chat that has questions while we get this set up? I'm sorry for the delay. I, was, I wasn't originally gonna show this video, but I think it's really helpful. And since we have time, I would really like to show some of these this clips of this video because I think it's gonna be helpful, instructive as to some recommendations um, on sampling guidance, which I think would be great. All right, Aaron, go ahead and test set out if you'd like. All right, here we go. In a thin sheet. Yep. Here, okay. it looks like we have someone trying to grab a sheet flow sample using a dustpan, but it's not working out. Right about now, he is probably wishing he could make a low spot in the pavement. Let's think about this. Does this sample look representative of the water leaving his property? What about all the dirt he stirred up digging that hole? This is definitely not the best way to collect a representative sheet flow sample. Let's go back and see what he did wrong. First of all, it looks like he is using a dustpan to try and collect his sample. Although this may sound like a reasonable way to collect a sample, the analytical method used for testing oil and grease does not allow water samples to be transferred from container to container, or the result may be biased low. This extends to the sample collection. No intermediate containers or sample collection devices may be used to collect an oil and grease sample. Dustpans, pitchers, or plastic bags are not allowed. The oil tends to stick to the sides of the intermediate containers, removing it from the sample and causing inaccurate analytical results. If you're using automatic samplers, things get a little complicated. We're not going to get into the details of using auto samplers in this video, but you should know that auto samplers must be specifically designed to handle parameters like oil and grease and pH. Another problem is that he is contaminating the stormwater sample by stepping in the water that he is sampling. The sample collector should always stand downstream or out of the water flow if possible. Our sampler then digs a hole in the nearby gravel and then uses his dustpan to collect the water. It turns out he's onto something here, but this is definitely the wrong approach. The sediment disturbed by digging ends up in his stormwater sample. That is not representative of what was flowing off his site. And he's still using the dustpan, so sorry pal. 
Now, we asked the quiz to look at the sampling location and suggest a better way to collect stormwater samples without breaking the bank or installing any major modifications. This is what she came up with. But remember, although this is a better sampling solution for a particular discharge point, it might not work at your facility. Pay attention to the concepts used here, not the specifics. When the QUISP saw the sampling location, she saw the need for two things. First, some sort of low spot must be installed to allow the sample bottles to be filled directly without using a secondary container. This problem was solved by installing a small underground pull box at the sampling location. The pull box is deep enough to accommodate the sample bottles. When not collecting samples, the lid is left closed and the stormwater flows over the pull box and discharges off-site. Second, the flow must be increased or concentrated in some way to make it easier to collect a sample. Whenever you are collecting samples, it is important to pay attention to your safety. Many times, your sample collection point might be in a vehicle or equipment traffic area. Not a great place to be working close to the ground. Make sure you are visible, and if possible, use the buddy system. Personal protective equipment is also important. Sampling usually involves cold weather, conditions, slippery surfaces, caustic chemicals, and dirty water. Make sure you're wearing appropriate clothing and footwear and use powder-free gloves and eye protection when handling stormwater or sample bottles. Also, don't forget about other PPE that may be required by your facility. Avoid smoking, eating, or drinking while collecting samples. Not only is it not safe, but there is a chance you can contaminate your sample. Now, let's move on to our second scenario, drain inlets. Collecting representative stormwater samples from drain inlets can be challenging, especially if there is a drain insert bag or other BMP installed, like in this case. It looks like our sample here is struggling with the drain insert bag. Having drain insert bags installed at sampling locations is almost always a problem, because at any time the bag is disturbed, it releases trapped pollutants and sediment back into the stormwater and right into your sample bottle. It looks like he's collecting a sample from the conveyance pipe at the bottom of the catch basin. Remember, looking for representative stormwater samples, and what our sampler did here was not the best way to capture a representative sample from a drain inlet. Let's see what he did wrong and find out what he could do better. The first problem that we see here is the facility has installed a drain bag at their sampling point. Drain bags can be great BMPs, but having one installed at your sample point can make it difficult to grab a representative sample, especially here where it looks like the holding straps have become weathered and brittle. Remember, samples should be collected after the BMP, which in this case results in a bunch of sediment being released and flowing right where he is collecting his sample. The second problem is that our sampler is not using good sampling technique. It looks like there is not a lot of flow in this drain, so he is scraping the bottom of the catch basin to fill up his sample bottle. This is not a representative sample because he is stirring up and sampling whatever material might have been lying at the bottom of this catch basin, which may contain pollutants left over from years past, or may have come from non-industrial sources. At any rate, it is not representative of the water leaving the facility. And if there was any preservative in the laboratory supplied sample bottle, he lost it while scraping the bottom of the catch basin and disqualified the sample. Unfortunately, these problems with sampling technique caused high analytical results, which were noticed by the water boards. The facility was inspected by the Regional Water Quality Control Board, who issued a notice of violation for inadequate sampling protocols and a non-compliance monitoring program. The facility contracted with a QUISP to respond to the violation. Let's see what the QUISP recommended for a better sampling setup. In addition to more regular sweeping and good housekeeping, the QUISP recommended that the facility remove the drain insert bag and replace it with a drop-in filter unit with a sampling port. And after studying the facility's drainage system, the QUIS determined that the most representative sample from this drain inlet should come from the water flowing into the drain, not from the water flowing in the stormwater pipe down below. This does two things. First, by installing a plastic drop-in filter with a sampling port, the BMP no longer has to be disturbed when collecting a sample. This means all of that sediment captured by the BMP will stay put until it can be cleaned and disposed of. Second, the drain insert funnels all of the water flowing into the drain through the filtration unit and out through a single opening in the bottom. 
This provides the sampler with a representative and post BMP sample of the water flowing into the drain. It is important to know where you should take the sample in the drain inlet. This depends on each particular drain and drainage system. In this case, the sampler collected samples from the drain line at the bottom of the catch basin. But because of possible commingling in the drain line, the quiz determined a sample from the water flowing into the drain would be more representative. Also, remember how the sampler was scraping the bottom of the catch basin while collecting the sample? This brings up a good point. You should never touch the sides or surface of the drain inlet with the sample bottle. You might contaminate the sample or break the glass bottle. Don't forget about safety. Did you notice the traffic cones? If you're in an area with vehicle traffic, make sure you're visible. Okay, let's move on to our last example, manholes. Taking stormwater samples from a manhole is a little less complicated than sheet flow or drain inlet samples, but there are still a few things you need to consider. It looks like he's using a sample boom, which is good. Keep in mind that manholes are confined spaces. You should never enter a manhole without a confined space entry permit and proper training. But it looks like he's having trouble collecting a sample from the bottom of the manhole. So he is just filling up his bottle from that other pipe. The problem is, we don't know where that pipe is coming from. And if he was supposed to collect a sample from the conveyance pipe, sampling from that other pipe is not a representative sample. Let's see how the QUISP approaches this situation. After studying the facility's drainage system, the QUIST determined that the water from both lines was industrial stormwater runoff and that a representative sample should be taken after the water coming out of the pipe commingles with the water in the conveyance line. And in order to solve the low flow situation, the QUIST recommended that the facility install a weir inside the manhole, which should be epoxy to the side of the manhole to prevent leaks. The weir would cause the water to back up inside the line, eventually becoming deep enough to collect a sample with the sample bottle. One thing to be aware of when installing a weir like this is that it changes when your facility discharges. Only collect samples after the water flows over the weir and any initially impounded water is cleared from the system. A system like this will also require maintenance. The area upstream of the weir will tend to fill up with sediment and other pollutants and will need regular inspections and cleaning. Okay, let's summarize. The purpose of this video is to give you general guidance, not an exhaustive sampling manual. There are many things that we didn't cover about collecting stormwater samples, but that are important for you to know. Make sure to read the current industrial general permit, especially those sections relating to stormwater monitoring and sampling. The most important thing that you should learn from this video is the concept of representative sampling. As a QUISP, you must look at the facility's drainage system and figure out the most representative sampling locations. Collecting stormwater samples is not just about filling up bottles. It's about getting an accurate snapshot of the facility's stormwater quality. It determines the facility's public compliance story. The data informs future facility investments in BMPs, and high-quality statewide data helps inform the Water Board's future permit development. I'm Shuka with the State Water Board. And I'm Brandon with the State Water Board. Happy, Happy sampling. sampling. Well, there you go. This is an excellent video. Uh, thank you for your patience. Let me call that up because I really want you to see um, some of the uh, techniques that they're talking about. It really highlights, really, in general, some of the things that I was talking about. Where, um, <clears throat> where we talk about, really, it comes down to, again, planning. It all comes down to planning. If you, uh, if you, uh, let me get back to my PowerPoint. Now I can share my PowerPoint with you. So it really does come down to planning. You wanna make sure that to get the best result, it starts with you thinking ahead, planning ahead. Notice that when he talked about, um, when they showed that we're, again, it wasn't something that, you know, we did it because we had a video, we could do it in a matter of minutes. But uh, that's not something that you can do in five minutes. Something you have to do ahead of time. Um, do you notice that we talked about the sheet flow and how they put things? So there's different approaches you have. So the question now is, Danny, are there any uh, any any other questions uh, any, in the chat we can we can address? Uh, no questions, but just a comment. They uh, they said that it was a good video. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it it, it was a, it, it was a good video. Um, I agree with that and it, um, because it, it really, it, it, it helps to clarify a lot of, uh, uh, kind of shows you some of the things that I've been trying to talk about. 
So um, we're pretty much done with the presentation. I know we're, we're a few minutes early. Uh, if you have any other questions, and we can, we can, we don't actually have to go the full hour, but uh, I'm here to entertain any questions you have. So bottom line is what? To recap, one, prepare. Two, if you can grab samples in a way that represents you, do it. You want to do representative samples. You want to make sure they represent the quality and quantity of water leaving your property. Three, um, you want to give yourself every chance for a good result. So uh, you, um, not that you're trying to cheat the system, but at the same time, you want to have a representative sample. So, you know, don't grab a sample right away. Wait a few minutes, grab your sample. When it discharge starts, um, you want to make sure that you have clean equipment. You want to make sure that you're protecting yourself, that your sump bottles are not open. And too so these are all just general tips, general ideas. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to fill them. I'm also going to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to have these slides up on the website for you to be able to, um, uh, if you want to download them, I also have, as I believe I mentioned before, I created a uh, certificate, which you can download and, and, and put into your sweat binder because the permit requires training materials to actually be in the binder. So I, what I'd recommend is printing up these slides and then print up the, and get that, that uh, certificate and check off all the, all the different parts you saw. Well, and we're going to end just a minute or two early, but unless there's any more questions, I just want to say thank you very much for joining me today for Stormwater Awareness Week. It's been a real honor to uh, have this time with you today, and I wish you all very well. Thank you. Take care now.